Hello and welcome to Bloodfields. My name is Kuba and in this video you can learn how to play the Bloodfields tabletop wargame. In order to get all the required accessories and miniatures, check out the links below. This game is 100% 3D printable, but you can also get everything you need shipped to you from our online store. The first thing you need to do in order to begin the game is choosing a scenario. In it, you will find instructions on how to set up the battlefield with the terrain and how to score victory points. In each game, it will be important not only to crush the enemies in direct combat, but also to outsmart them strategically. Each of two players has to pick out their own team of warriors. Each character has a blood point cost, and each scenario has a point limit that cannot be exceeded. All units' character cards can be found at bloodfields.net. In this web app, you can save and edit your rosters, as well as export them to PDF and print them out with one simple click. Every unit is part of an army, and the armies are grouped in eight realms. As long as you are using units from a single army, your units get special loyalty bonus. You can also mix and match units from the entire realms to find more powerful combos and combinations. Now that every player has a roster and the corresponding miniatures, it is time to deploy them on the battlefield. First, the players roll a d6 and the one with the higher result can choose first either to receive an initiative token or to pick their side of the battlefield. The second player is left with the remaining choice. The player with the initiative token is now the first to place one of their units from their roster into the deployment zone on their side of the battlefield. Afterwards, the second player places one of their units in the same manner, and the players alternately repeat this process until all their units are deployed. Now begins the first round of the battle. First, the player with initiative token chooses who will be the starting player in the round. If he chooses himself, he passes the initiative token to the second player who will be making the choice in the next round. If he chooses the opponent to start, he gets to keep the initiative token for now. The starting player is the first to distribute inspired tokens to their units. The number of inspired tokens to distribute is listed in each scenario, typically being equal to the number of players' alive units. The inspired tokens are used to pay for special attacks and abilities and to improve attack and defense roles in critical situations. Player can distribute the inspired tokens among their units in any way they see fit. After the starting player is done allocating the tokens, the second player distributes them in the same manner. All unused inspired tokens are discarded at the end of a round, and the players will distribute them again at the beginning of the next one. Once the round preparation is over, it is time to begin activating the units. In this sample game, we have the Everdark Elves facing the vile Dragonborn. The unit cards were modified for the demo game. Players will choose one of their units alternately and perform two actions with each until all units have been activated and the round ends. Units can perform move action, attack action and ability action any number of times in a turn. The charge action, magic action, flee action and battle focus action have one per turn limit. Let's see how units use the actions and how they are resolved. Dark Elf Lord is using a move action. A move action allows it to move up to the number of inches indicated by the unit's movement statistic. The unit cannot move through other units and impassable terrain, like buildings and rocks. It has to go around them. A move action can be used any number of times in a turn. The Dark Elf Lord uses a move action again 
and finishes it with its base in direct contact with Dragonborn, Dragon Leader. Those units are now in combat. The Lord cannot do anything to follow up, as he has used up the two actions and his turn ends. Second player activates the Dragon Leader. The unit is in combat, so it cannot move, use a charge action or perform ranged attacks. It can, however, use melee attack action against the enemy it is in combat with. In order to use it, a unit has to choose an attack from their unit's card. In this case, the powerful Banner Swing attack. The player chooses the attack's target, the Dark Elf Lord, and pays the attack's Inspire cost if there is any. Banner Swing costs one Inspire token, so Dragon Leader removes one Inspire token from their pool. Once the attack is ready, Perform the attack roll by rolling the number of attack dice indicated in the attack's profile. Then, each die has to be changed either to a hit or a miss. The goal is to generate as many hits as possible. Dragon Leader rolls a Skull result, two Mastery results, two Inspire results and a Blank result. Skull results are hits. Mastery results are changed to hits or misses, depending on the unit's mastery statistic. Melee attacks use melee mastery, ranged attacks use ranged mastery, and magic attacks use an arcane mastery. When the statistic is free or lower, it means that the unit is not very skilled in these kinds of attacks, and it changes all mastery results to misses. If the statistic is exactly 4, it changes one mastery result to a hit and the rest are misses. And if the unit statistic is 5 or higher, the unit is an expert and changes all mastery results to hits. In the case of the Dragon Leader, he has a melee mastery of 4, so one mastery result is changed to a hit and the remaining ones are misses. Now to the Inspire results. These are changed to hits or misses depending on the unit's inspiration. If, after the roll, the unit decides to spend a single Inspire token, it changes all Inspire results to hits, otherwise they are misses. Dragon Leader does have another Inspire token and decides to spend it, thus changing all Inspire results to hits. Finally, the blank results are always misses. This leaves us with 4 hits and leads us to the defense roll. Now the enemy has a chance to mitigate some hits by rolling a defense die for each hit. Dark Elf Lord rolls 4 dice. Each die has to be changed either to a save or a fail. The results are a deflect result, an armor result, an Inspire result and a Blank result. The Deflect results are saves. The Armor results are changed to saves or fails depending on the defending unit's armor statistic. For each point in armor, the unit can change one armor result to a save and the rest are fails. Dark Elf Lord has two armor, so it can change the one armor result to a save without a problem. If the unit had rolled 3 armor results, it would only be able to save 2. Now to the Inspire result. Analogically, as in the attack roll, all Inspire results can be changed to saves by spending a single Inspire token. Dark Elf Lord does not have any Inspire tokens, so it cannot change the results to saves and they are changed to fails. Finally, the blank results are always fails. In the end, from the four hits coming Elf's way, two of them were saved. Now it is time to deal damage. For each unsaved hit, the defending unit loses the amount of HP indicated by the damage icon in the attack profile. This means that two damage tokens are placed on Dark Elf Lord. Dragon Leader has now finished its first action and has one more action to perform. 
it can use the attack action again. However, the banner swing has a unique indicator. It means that it can only be used once per unit's turn. So Dragon Leader cannot use it again until his next turn. Dragon Leader also has the Pyroblast attack, but it is a ranged attack and it cannot be used when a unit is in combat. Ranged attacks can be distinguished from melee attacks by having the range value in the first line of an attack profile. This leaves us with the unit's basic attack. Each unit in the game has a basic attack that is not printed on the unit card, but is always available. This basic attack is pretty basic, but it is better than nothing, so Dragon Leader uses it. He rolls two skulls, which are two hits, so Dark Elf Lord rolls two defense dice. It rolls an Inspire result and a blank result. And, as it has no Inspire tokens to change the Inspire result to a save, it is a fail, leading to two unsaved hits and thus two more damage placed on the Dark Elf Lord, leaving him at 1 HP. Now back to the Ever Dark Elf's activation. Dark Elf Lurker will join the battle. First, it uses an ability. Using an ability is an action. Lurker has a Dark Slide ability that allows it to blink 6 inches, which is a bit more than it would move with a move action with its movement statistic being 4. However, using that ability costs 1 Inspire token. Blink is a special move type that has additional rules. It allows a unit to leave combat and be placed anywhere in the Blink's range. For some other types of special move like flying and pushing, check out the movement section in the rulebook. Then, in the second action, it uses a charge. Charge action can be used once per unit's turn, and it allows a unit to move into combat and attack the enemy in a single action. On the downside, there is a chance for a charge to fail. When using a charge action, First, the unit has to choose a visible target. It chooses the Dragon Leader, which has put the Dark Elf Lord dangerously low. The second thing is to establish the charge test value. The value is the distance between the charging and the charged unit's bases. This value will be the difficulty of the charge test. Here, the distance between the units is 8.8 .8 inches. Last thing to do before the test is determining the charge's type. The charge can be easy or hard. Easy charge is when the charging unit can move in a straight line into contact with any point of the charged unit base, without any terrain or other units on the path. Hard charge is when the path is obstructed by other units or terrain. In the game, there is also a very hard charge that is performed when an effect specifically states that the charge is very hard. In the current case, the charge is easy, as the lurker can move directly to the enemy with nothing on the way. The unit has to now pass a charge test. In an easy charge test, you roll two d6 dice and choose the higher result. You then add that result to the unit's movement statistic. If the sum is equal or higher than the distance between the units, the charge is successful. If the sum is lower, or if the unit rolls one result on both dice, the charge fails. Dark Elf Lurker rolls a 1 and a 6. It chooses the higher result, 6, and adds it to its movement statistic of 4 for a total of 10. When compared to the test's value of 8.8, .8, the result is higher, so the charge is successful. After successfully passing the charge test, the unit is moved to combat with the target. After an easy charge, it can be placed in any position that leads to the target in a straight, unobstructed line. Now, as a result of a successful charge, the unit can perform a free melee attack against the enemy. It chooses the Night Slash attack, which costs 0 Inspire tokens to use. Lurker rolls the indicated 3 attack dice and gets 3 mastery results. 
Because the unit's melee mastery is 5, it can change all the mastery results to hits for the total of 3 hits in the attack. Dragon Leader now defends, rolls 3 defense dice and rolls 2 armor results and a blank result. With its 1 armor, he can change 1 armor result to a save and the remaining 2 are fails. Because Night Slash has the damage indicator of 2, each unsaved hit places 2 damage tokens on the Dragon Leader for a total of 4. Now back to the Dragonborn player. It chooses to activate Dragon Archer now, which has a powerful ranged attack that he wants to use against the Dark Elf Mage. However, ranged attacks, abilities and spells can only target visible units and Dragon Archer is behind a rock that is blocking its vision. In order to establish if another unit is visible, it must be possible to draw a straight line from any point on one unit's base to any point on another unit's base. This line is called the line of sight and it cannot go through impassable terrain like rocks and buildings. It can however go through other units and passable terrain like forests and swamps. Dragon Archer is behind the rack, so it cannot draw a line of sight to the mage. In the first action he has to use a move action to reposition in a way that will make an enemy visible. Now in the second action he can finally use the ranged attack action. However, Dragon Archer's ranged attack has quite a short range, not enough to reach any enemy. Fortunately, Dragon Archer has a Dragon Sight ability. Dragon Sight has a lightning icon, which makes it an effortless ability. This means that using it does not cost an action. A unit is allowed to use any number of effortless abilities in its turn. Dragon Archer pays 1 Inspire to activate Dragon Sight ability and extend the range of its ranged attacks until the end of turn. Now he can still use the second action to use the Dragon Arrow attack. Dragon Archer chooses a now visible enemy, the Dark Elf Mage. The Dragon Arrow attack has a special rule that improves the, that attack if the enemy is at least at half range. Unfortunately, even after the range was extended with Dragon Sight, the enemy is too far to provide the bonus. Dragon Archer rolls 3 attack dice and rolls 3 inspire results. Dragon Archer has no more inspire tokens, so it cannot change them to hits. No dice are then rolled in the defense roll and no damage is dealt. Now Dark Elf Mage is chosen to be activated. This unit has an Arc Mage trait. It means that the unit has access to the powerful magic action available only to mages and Arc Mages. When a unit uses a magic action, it can cast two spells if it is a mage and three spells if it is an Arc Mage in a single action. After using a magic action, a mage can cast the spells printed on its unit card or the spells from their school of magic which requires purchasing a School of Magic item during roster creation. Spells do not have an Inspire cost. Instead, each spell has a spell difficulty. Every time a unit attempts to cast a spell, it has to pass a magic test. Each individual spell can only be cast once per magic action, no matter if it was cast successfully or not, and even the unsuccessfully cast spells count towards the 2 or 3 spell limit per magic action. Dark Elf Mage uses the magic action and attempts to cast the first of 3 spells. It chooses the Restoration from its unit card. When a spell or ability instructs to target an ally, the user can choose himself as the target. However, in this situation, Dark Elf Mage chooses Dark Elf Lord as the target. Now the mage has to pass a magic test. In the magic test, roll two d6 dice, choose a higher result and add it to the caster's arcane mastery statistic. If the sum is higher or equal to the spell's difficulty, 
the spell is cast successfully. Otherwise, the spell fails and does nothing. Like in other tests, rolling two ones always results in the test being failed. Dark Elf Mage rolls a 3 and a 4. It adds the higher result to its Arcane Mastery of 4 and the sum surpasses the spell difficulty so the spell is cast successfully and its rules can now be resolved. Dark Elf Lord restores 1 HP so 1 damage token is removed from it. Now the Archmage attempts to cast the second spell, Empower. In the magic test, she rolls to 1 results. When 1 is added to her arcane mastery, the sum is not enough to pass the spell's difficulty. But not only that, when 2 ones are rolled in a magic test, the test automatically fails and the caster loses 1 HP due to mana burn. Dark Elf Mage has one more spell to cast. The last spell it will attempt is a ranged attack. You can tell that the spell is an attack by it having the damage and dice indicators in the profile. A unit casting a spell that is an attack has to meet the same requirements as using an attack in an attack action. In case of a ranged attack, the unit cannot be in combat and the visible enemy has to be in range. Dark Elf Mage can and does choose Dragon Archer as the target. Now the unit has to again pass a magic test. It rolls a 5 and a 6. 6 together with Arcane Mastery of 4 gives 10, which is equal to the spell's difficulty, therefore the spell is cast successfully and the attack is performed. If the mage had rolled two sixes in a magic test, the test would be automatically passed and the caster would gain one inspired token due to mana focus. Dark Elf Mage rolls four dice. It rolls two skulls and two mastery results. This attack has a critical strike keyword and icon. Critical strike means that the dice rolled as skulls are automatic unsaved hits and the enemy cannot perform a defense roll against them. The enemy will still perform a defense roll against the remaining hits generated by the attack. You can find a short list of common keywords in the Bloodfields manual that includes critical strike, armor penetration, lifesteal and more. Back to the attack roll. In magic attacks the unit uses their arcane mastery to change mastery results to hits. Dark Elf Mage's arcane mastery is 4 so it can change one mastery result to a hit and the other one is a miss. The enemy therefore rolls one defense die. It rolls a blank which together with two hits from critical strikes gives a total of three unsaved hits. Three damage tokens are placed on Dragon Archer. The mage has one more action left, as all three spells were cast in a single magic action. She wants to charge the Dragon Leader. He is in the proper distance for the charge, 10.1 inches, but the charge will have to go through other unit or terrain, in this case through Dark Elf Lurker. This means that the charge is possible, but it is a hard charge. In a hard charge, the unit also rolls two d6 dice, but chooses the lower result and adds it to its movement statistic. The hard charge is failed when the sum is lower than the charge test value, or when there is a one result on any die in the charge test. If Dark Elf Mage rolls at least two fives in the charge test, the result summed with its movement statistic of 5 will result in a successful charge. Charge cannot be used if the target is outside of that maximal possible distance the unit could travel in a charge, which typically is the unit's movement statistic plus 6, the highest result of the die in a charge test. Charge action also cannot be used when the charging unit is in combat, or it has used the charge action this turn. Now back to the test. Dark Elf Mage rolls a 1 and a 4. In a hard charge, if there is a 1 result on any die in the charge test, the charge automatically fails. After a failed charge, the charging unit moves in a straight line towards the charged unit by the number of inches indicated by the lower result of the dice rolled in the charge test. The Archmage moves 1 inch toward the target. 
if there would be impassable terrain or another unit, even the charges target on that moves path, the unit stops 1 16th of an inch in front of it. After a failed charge, a unit can continue its turn, but in case of a Dark Elf Mage, it has no more actions left, so its turn ends anyways. Now it is the Dragonborn player's turn to activate, and he chooses to activate his support units. Support units are distinguishable by the support trait indicated on their unit's cards. Support units are the only ones that can be added to a roster in multiple, up to four copies. Each support unit has a separate HP pool, its own Inspire tokens, and do not have to be located in proximity to other support units on the battlefield. However, all support units perform their turn in a single activation. Once a player activates their supports, he or she performs actions one by one with all their support units. Only after all support units perform all their actions, the other player can proceed with activating one of their units. For the purpose of generating Inspire tokens at the beginning of a round, all support units together count as one alive unit. The player has two Dragon Link supports. He chooses one to perform actions with it first. This unit has a ranged attack and there is a visible enemy in range, so it uses a ranged attack action. However, there is a passable terrain, a forest, completely blocking the way between the units, which brings us to cover rules. When a unit targeted by a ranged attack has cover, in the defense role it can change all Inspire results to saves without spending an Inspire token. A unit has cover when the line of sight cannot be drawn without it going through passable terrain. And for the purpose of cover, units allied with the target that have a larger base also count as passable terrain. This means that you can hide smaller units behind bigger ones to give them cover. A unit also has cover when it is in combat, and also when it is standing inside certain types of passable terrain, like a forest, swamp or ruins. In this case, it is not possible to draw the line of sight from any point on the Dragon Link's base to any point on the Dark Elf Mage's base without it going through passable terrain. Therefore, for this attack, the mage will have cover. The Dragon Link attacks with Pyroblast that has two dice and rolls two Skulls results that give two hits. Dark Elf Mage rolls two defense dice and rolls two Inspire results. The mage does not have to spend Inspire token because it can change all Inspire results to saves due to it being in cover. In the second action, the Dragon Link uses a charge action. He wants to charge the Dark Elf Lurker. It is in the proper distance for the charge 7.5 inches, but the charge will go through other units and terrain. This means that the charge is possible, but it is a hard charge. The Dragon Link rolls a 5 and a 6. The lower result, 5, added to its movement statistic of 4, gives 9, so enough to pass the test's value of 7.5. After passing a hard charge test, the charging unit is placed in combat with the charge's target in the closest unoccupied space. After any successful charge, before the attack, a unit can also choose to use any number of effortless abilities. Dragon Link has an effortless Fumes ability that allows it to put a weakness token on the enemy. Weakness token reduces by 2 the unit's melee, ranged and arcane mastery and lasts until the end of that unit's next activation. For a couple more tokens used in Bloodfields, check out the token section in the rulebook. After the ability is used, Dragon Link can perform the free melee attack it got from charging. Dragon Link does not have any melee attacks printed on the unit card, so it uses a basic attack. It rolls one skull and one mastery result. Unfortunately, its melee mastery is not high enough to change even the single mastery result to a hit. Dark Elf Lurker defends from one hit by rolling a single defense die. It rolls an armor result, and with its armor statistic of 2, 
it changes it to a safe and receives no damage. The first Dragon Link has exhausted its actions. Now, in the same support activation, the player will perform actions with the second Dragon Link. This unit is standing in a forest. Each type of possible terrain in Bloodfields has special rules that affect the units. When a unit is standing in a forest, it has to roll a d6 die at the beginning of its turn. If it rolls a 1, it cannot charge until the end of that turn. Other terrain with special rules are swamps, ruins, high grounds and fences. For a complete overview of the new terrain in Bloodfields Eternal Sorrow, check out the terrain section in the rulebook. The Dragon Link rolls a 1. It means that it gets entangled and cannot charge this turn. The Dragon Link can, however, still use the ranged attack action. It chooses Dark Elf Lurker as the target. However, Dark Elf Lurker is in combat with two other units allied with the Dragon Link, the Dragon Leader and another Dragon Link. This causes two things. First of all, a unit in combat has cover. And secondly, when shooting at a target that's in combat with allies, there is a risk of friendly fire and harming your allies. If a player is ready to take that risk, he has to be careful to not roll any blank results in the attack roll. That's because every blank is an automatic 1 damage to every ally in combat with the target without a defense roll. The Dragon Link rolls a Skull and a Blank, so both units in combat with Dark Elf Lurker lose 1 HP. There is, however, a single hit. Dark Elf Lurker rolls an Inspire result in the defense roll, and because he is in combat, he gets to change that result to a save without spending an Inspire token. The Dragon Link's attack into combat was not very effective, so in the second action he uses the Battle Focus action. This action can be used once per turn, and it provides the user with one Inspire token that the Dragon Link might be able to use later in this round. However, with the Dragon Link activation, the entire round is about to end, as every unit on the battlefield was activated. Before that, Dark Elf Lord has one more trick up its sleeve. This unit has a passive ability that causes every enemy in combat with it to lose 1 HP at the end of the round. Each unit has a main passive ability and may have any number of additional passive abilities printed on the card. Dark Elf Lord is in combat with the Dragon Leader, who receives 1 damage. Dragon Leader has 6 HP, and earlier he has received 4 damage from the Lurker, and one damage from the friendly fire. When the amount of damage is equal to its HP, the unit is destroyed and the dragon leader is removed from the battlefield. The round now ends for good. The players score points accordingly with the scenario. In this scenario, players gain points for destroying enemy units equal to the unit's blood point cost. This means that Everdark player is in the lead by destroying a Dragon Leader worth 30 points. Another scenario objective is controlling the areas around the objective flags. At the end of the round, the player that has more units in 3 inches from the flag receives 30 victory points. As there is only one unit next to the flag, and it belongs to the Everdark Elves player, that player gains 30 more victory points. The last thing to do at the end of the round is to remove all unused Inspire tokens from all units. After the round ends, a new round begins. The player with the initiative token chooses the starting player, new Inspire tokens are distributed to the units, and the players once again activate all their units. The game ends after the number of rounds predetermined in a scenario. There is one more action that we have not covered in this round. The units can use a flee action. It is only available when a unit is in combat and only as a first action in a unit's turn. After using a flee action, the unit has to pass a morale test with a difficulty of 10. In order to pass it, the unit rolls two d6 dice, chooses the higher result and adds it to its morale statistic. 
If the sum is equal or higher than the difficulty of 10, the test is passed and a unit can move up to the number of inches indicated in their movement statistic. In this move, the unit can move through the unit or units it was in combat with. Then it can continue its turn, use ranged attacks or perform magic action, but it cannot charge. If the test fails, however, the unit's turn instantly ends. Thank you for watching the video. We hope that you now have a good understanding of all the mechanics used in the new Bloodfields Eternal Sorrow tabletop skirmish wargame. For more details, be sure to check out the rulebook, the scenario book, and the digital library of all unit cards at bloodfields.net. Be sure to check out the links in the description below to join the world of Bloodfields today, and I'll see you on the battlefield.